The UDR cast is not affiliated and does not represent any 12-step fellowship. I, Bill Ward, the host of the UDR cast, will be sharing my experience and my journey of recovery. That does include, but is not limited to, the literature contained in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps. Our guests will be sharing their own path to recovery and what has worked for them. The UDR cast encourages and supports all paths to recovery. Welcome everybody to the UDR cast. UDR stands for Uncover, Discover and Recover. My name is Bill Ward and I'm coming to you from the recovery capital of Canada, Calgary, Alberta. Here we are going to discuss everything recovery, different perspectives, different experiences, both with the people I know and with others from around the world. If you resonate with anything you've heard on this episode today, we ask that you share it with anyone who you think may benefit from it. If you have any questions or comments, please find us at billward.life and send us a message in the info section. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. If you are interested in more recovery content, you can find the buttons for the YouTube channel and other social media outlets on the homepage, and you will be redirected to those platforms. We can recover. One person, one family, one community at a time. You know, I can only look back from the experience in the books that I've read, but early in the program of recovery, they used to vet the alcoholics to make sure they were actually alcoholics. And they used to assign you a sponsor and you had to work this path thoroughly followed. And the directions were very clear cut. Remember in the original manuscript, it says, if you are ready to follow directions, if you want what we have and you are ready to follow directions, it's right here. Um, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our directions. In that original manuscript, it's all about directions. So I believe in those early days, these gentlemen were really taking you through the directions. So hence, the recovery rates were 50 or 75%. They were very high because they were specifically shown the directions. And like you just said, the process was not veered from. And the results from the process proved themselves. But over the years, it's been watered down, it's been watered down, and then the results change because of opinions, because of theories, and and fucking now today, it's kind of like you and I are the old timers, back in the 40s, bringing the directions, talking about the fucking brotherly and harmonious action and how to fucking get there, but we're, we're looking like the oddballs. Yeah. But we're so convicted in our stance that it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah, it doesn't waver. Because our our data solidifies it and our experience in the literature with our own lives solidifies it. And as we sponsor men and show them these directions, the results are the results. So it doesn't waver. So when I work with people, I tell them, this is a lonely fucking road to do it like this. But I want you to understand Instead of regarding ourselves as intelligent agents, spearheads of God's ever-advancing creation, we are intelligent agents, which means collectors of data. Why are we collecting data? To be a spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. So we're spearheads of this program, and the program is based essentially in love. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. And we don't really care about other people's opinions because we just keep going down this road and the results and the fruit bear itself and, and we fucking keep on rolling. What the fuck are we talking about? I kind of want to add to that though. So it's not that, it's not that like when you say that we don't care about, when you say that we don't care about other people's opinions, I know that that's actually not what you're getting at. That's, that's how you would blanket it like from a surface standpoint. But when you go in depth on that, when you know what you know, Right. When you you have seen this, it is grounded. Right. So when I see results and those results are grounded and I'm right with God and I'm based in humility, it doesn't like like we had chatted about. It doesn't waver because I know what I know. Right. So you could come up to me. You could say that I don't know what I'm talking about and this, this, that. And I don't even have to argue with you because I know what I know. And that is a period statement. 
That's where the discussion star starts and that's where it ends right then and there for me. And I could just let this gentleman berate me if he so feels and it doesn't waver anything. From the men that I've seen recover to the families that I've seen recover. What I want to do is I actually want to take it back to the suggestions. Directions and suggestions. And we got to remember that this book is not written solely for the alcoholic. It's written for back in the day for the medical fraternity, for the to the employers, to the wives, to the family. And even in the original manuscript, Alcoholics Anonymous, we we 12 step anybody, especially alcoholics, yeah. if you remember that. Yeah. All throughout the book, it's riddled that if the man doesn't work out, you work with his fucking family, dude. Your family sobers his family. And so to the wife of the alcoholic, to the employer, a family member, these are suggestions. But of course, for the real deal alcoholic, because this book is written for the guy on the street talking to himself. He's been there for four decades. That's what this, that's who this book is specifically written for is the absolute low bottom case where even you as an alcoholic look at him and call this man hopeless. That's, that's who this book is written for. So for that man, it's directions and nothing short of, yeah. right? Like I was just working with a gentleman a day or so ago and we had gone through this and I had recited that it's something I've recited with many men when we get on further on clear cut directions, right? That piece. And, uh, and I had said for, I, I didn't say specifically for him, but for the real deal alcoholic, this is not fucking suggestions, my man. This is clear cut directions. If you want what we have, we will direct you to that as a working manual, as a Haynes manual for my car to rebuild it. This is, this is essentially a working document, a working manual to get recovery. So yesterday I was at a meeting and, uh, it was on a reading in the big book, and then it was also on a topic. The topic that came up was Rule 62. Don't take yourself too seriously. And as I shared, like most of the shares were on, like, don't take yourself too seriously. There is a world of levity and worldliness about us, and, you know, let's just have fun, right? And then I get up there and, I, and I'm sharing in the meeting and I said, oh, on this topic, uh, don't take yourself too seriously. That's why the fuck I'm here. Because I've taken myself so fucking seriously my whole fucking life. Selfish self-centeredness is the root of my trouble. I got to be rid of this shit or it fucking kills us just like it's been killing these men lately. Because it's selfish self-centeredness. And it isn't the substance that's killing them. That might be the headline at the end of the day. But it's the selfish self-centeredness. This we must be rid of or it kills us. And God makes that possible to get rid of that, right? So I was talking all about this Rule 62 in a totally different aspect where I'm like, no, this is the problem. And in a room where you got all these desperate alcoholics and you're telling them not to take themselves too seriously, to me, you're just giving them that scapegoat to, to just do what you've always fucking done. Yeah, it's like progress before perfection. Right. It's the same premise, right? So I'm disturbing them on the question of alcoholism in a way that nobody expected. Mm -hmm. And it goes from a little bit of a light feeling of a meeting. And I don't know why, but I just can't like, I, I don't like, I don't always laugh at meetings and, and I'm not always like light. I'm fucking very serious. Mm -hmm. So again, that character trait came out again and I'm fucking dead serious mm. and I fucking deliver this message but what I do is I disturb people on the question of alcoholism and what's your take what the fuck are we talking about disturbing people of the question of alcoholism I mean like so like we had mentioned before I mean it is the big book in the literature that brings us to the action especially in regards to sponsorship like majority of this is a it's almost like a test bed to where you're in the rooms, this is where you first start integrating um, your character. You start practicing humility in there. You start trying to get sponsees in there. You are working around the opposite sex. You are working around other egos, all this other stuff, right? So 
in this process, the biggest thing to cut the nonsense is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It can't be fucking argued with, right? So when you subject yourself more to the direction and dictates of that book, right? Like I said, on the question of alcoholism, um, disturbing them, why, how, how we've been able to do that and grown in that is because the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says it is how we started the action. And then from that moment on, we've been vindicated in that. And so what that is, is that they are more likely to follow your suggestions. That's the piece, right? Honesty without compassion is just fucking brutality, right? So when you understand the alcoholic condition, when you understand that a lot of the times when you go to a meeting, it's like you're going to a, a stage four cancer ward, terminal. These men are terminal. It's masked by pride, all this other stuff. When you come to that understanding, you can't help but take it serious, right? So when you disturb these guys, the question of alcoholism, you're doing it only, solely, because they're going to be more likely to follow your suggestions. Like I mentioned before, I've said this many times. I feel very serious about it. As I don't remember the guy when I was coming in and out dying of alcoholism that shined my shoes, patted me on the back and told me everything was going to be okay. I can't see his face, nor do I know his name. But the guy who told me, keep it up, you're going to fucking die. What are you doing around here? You're wasting the seat, those types of things. I remember those guys. That stu stuck with me. That cut me, right? Because this delusion's so thick that as we had chatted about before, it's only pain and, and frankness. Like a candid, very cutting, you know, um, straight to the point, no nonsense conversation. That has the ability, not to say it always will, but it's more likely to, right? Mm -hmm. So like where, like, like where my sponsorship took off, like I was talking about using this, because this doesn't work. It's not like I disturb you the question of alcoholism, then all of a sudden, you know, I'm sponsoring you. It's not really how it goes. It takes some time. You know, it takes some time. As this guy's kind of going downhill, it takes some time. Me saying the same things, me kind of, you know, like not like sucker punching them or anything like that, but Thinking just, just kind of pointing out some very generic shit because these alcoholics, all of them are, are the same. They're exact same person. They think the same way. The only thing that differentiates one alcoholic to another, as far as I'm concerned, is the temperament of that alcoholic. Is it's either he's aggressive, passive aggressive, or full blown passive. Other than that, the way he thinks will be, you know, those are the only differences. All, all the things he's going to say and do pretty well follow those, those temperaments. So early recovery, I had that, that Buick, if you remember. And uh, it had bench seats. So I'd pack this vehicle with five guys from one of the houses. And I would talk directly to one guy, knowing that what we're talking about is very general for majority of these other guys. And in turn, I would be disturbing the whole car to and from the meeting. And I'd pro out of a car of five guys, I'd probably end up sponsoring three of them, if not more than that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it is probably one of the biggest tools I have in regards to sponsorship is disturbing these guys, the question of alcoholism. So two things. One, everything ends at the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It starts and it ends there. Yeah. And I think for me that's been very valuable because as I come and kind of shake the foundation of the room sometime, um, there's a lot of blowback and opinion back towards me on the take that I have. Mm. But it's very limited on the combativeness back towards me because I'm always out of the book. So you can't really attack me on my opinions because my opinions are based out of the book. It's based out of facts of my experience through sponsorship. And so it's very solid um, as far as not being able to really combat my character because I'm all out of the book. And that's really important. And as we kind of keep working through this program, and when you mentioned the word consistent, I've always said I stay consistent and persistent to the commitment of what's in this book. And over the years, so usually guys in their first six months or first year, they hear a guy like me or a guy like you speaking, nine times out of ten, they ain't coming anywhere fucking near us. Yeah, like they, well, like they already weed themselves out. Right? Yeah, they weed themselves out. 
And what I like to t talk about is I'm actually predicting their future. I am going to say, okay, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Like essentially it's like this. I'll use an example. The real alcoholic cycle is you burn your life down. You end up in detox. You go to treatment center. You get out. You think you're well. You get the job. You get the girl. You get the wheels. And then the wheels fall off and you're back to fucking detox. You're back to treatment. You fucking feel good again. And then you're back to the fucking job. You're back to the woman, you're back to the wheels, and the wheels fall off again. That's the real alcoholic cycle that we see predominantly that happens. And as we predict those kind of things in the sharing that we do, um, it really disturbs people. Yeah. They want nothing to do with you. Yeah. And they also even take offense that you're talking about treatment centers in a negative way. Yeah. Because we'll often combat treatment centers yeah. to a degree. But over the time, over the years... These guys with the six months of the year that want nothing to do with us, that maybe are even fucking saying some nasty shit or whatever, they end up coming to us two, three years down the road, four years down the road, and they want our fucking help because we predicted the future of their life, and it fucking came to fruition exactly how we've said, and they're still fucking drunk, they're still fucking newcomers, they're still going through jobs, and they're still ending up in detox and treatment centers. And that's not the solution. So, and this just happened recently with a guy who just came back to a meeting and came to you and asked you to sponsor him, yep. right? Yep. But these guys will stay the fuck away from us for a long time. And I'll finish with this. There was a guy who recently came to me. I've known him for the whole six years. I've watched him get sober, get drunk, get sober, get drunk, get sober, get drunk. He's actually begging me to sponsor him. And I'm like, dude, I can't. I don't have the time. And at some time in the past, I would have said yes, just out of compassion or I don't want to see him die, but I really can't bend these rules anymore. I got to stick within my parameters for my own balance and well-being. Yeah. So I kept saying, no, I can't do this. I can't do this. And, and I asked the guy, I'm like, dude, I've known you for six fucking years. Why the fuck are you asking me now? He's like, because I've known the people that you've sponsored, I know many people that you sponsor. And he says, I wasn't ready for what you were fucking delivering. And the guys that I know that you've sponsored, they say you take this shit really seriously. And I was never ready for that. But I am now. But the shitty part was I wasn't able to give him what he wanted finally on his own self-will for his own relief. He's coming to me finally out of the relief. But I'm the last house on the block. And then we're sitting there talking and he's like, I, I don't know who else who's going to sponsor me. And then we name a whole bunch of people who are very good sponsors. But he's been through them all. And you get to the point where there's, there's fucking nothing left. You've almost burnt out the program. You can only do so many step fives. You can only be sponsored so well. And then what? So I don't know what he's going to do. I know he did pick up a guy as a sponsor, but, you know, just so I sit back and collect the data and maybe somewhere down the road, if I find the time, I'll give this guy a crack at it. But uh, it's the same guy that actually I was pushing towards you, but you had nailed his character so fucking perfectly. Like you just said, the alcoholic is not unique. They just have these different few different little traits, right? So you nailed this guy, you prayed and meditated, you talked to some pillars, you knew that this was probably going to happen, but you were hoping it wouldn't this time, and I kind of convinced you maybe it won't. So then what happened? <laughs> he did the exact same thing that we predicted, and, uh, you know, it's, it gets very easy. Like, it does get very easy in that respect, because they are, are all the same. In many respects, especially in this. So this is like, I'll give you an example. Like I end up, uh, you know, old, old friend in the program. He's been out, hadn't seen him. You know, I see him in one of the houses and uh, he's not really talking about how bad he was. He's talking about all these accomplishments within the first 10 seconds of me and him chatting. And I knew right then and there that it will one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink. The whole thing's already crooked, right? The, the ego has already reasserted itself. This guy's in rehab, 
you know, has burnt it down pretty good. I think he, I think in this case, he only got the first nip of the ringer, but still the pride and ego was still very much apparent, you know, mm. and you could tell that mm -hmm. you could tell that it's very easy to spot that once you've seen it enough, you know, when a guy is telling you he has a plan, he's drunk. He could be sober and dude, he could be sober for a couple fucking years, mm -hmm. but that is going to be a bleed out on self. He is going to be bleeding self for however long that he's actually fucking sober for. These guys don't understand that. Like I remember, and, and I bring this up uh, because I love it. I think it's, I think it's a very good uh, caricature of certain people in the program that me and you, or at least myself don't really run into too much. But when we're, when we're working in and out of a certain province, a province which I personally love. I love its people. I love its policies. But its program is fucking garbage. Some of the worst I've ever seen in the whole country. And specifically, we were driving up, uh, going to another province for uh, Christmas, a Christmas family visit, me and you. And we got into this room. And this individual starts talking about uh, shielding herself from alcohol. And she starts talking about one specific thing she says is, is she says, I don't even go to people's houses, uh, you know, when they cook because you know, they cook with alcohol and I'm listening to this. Like you have 15 years. I'm like, you know what? You could have drank fucking 12 years ago and maybe had another 10 years of real program. We're not talking about dry and blow my brains out. We're talking about sober and happy, sober and happy. Two things I never thought possible, right? Listening to this person shielding, they don't understand that they easily could have drank, oh, a decade ago and would have been a decade into a good life, right? Like the, the lie, the fool's paradise that's being perpetuated, that you have the deep level of concession, that deep level that me and you had chatted about, the first requirement um, of the program, this gut level concession found in Roland Hazard's story, found in Fred's story. Uh, once a man has that, a lot of the times this guy will never fucking drink. He will blow his brains out before he fucking drinks. And when that's fully supplanted and there's not the follow-up work, this guy could have a worse life dry than he ever would have had drinking. But he's under the guise that alcohol is the problem. He's under the guise that alcohol is what really fucks me. Where alcohol essentially alleviate, alleviates what has always fucked him. It is the solution. It is the, um, it is the anesthetic of the real problem. Alcohol is a medicine. Gambling. Drugs, women, all these things could see, be seen as medicine, as relief from me on me. It just brings me back to that line that I repeated earlier. The character defects representing instincts gone astray has been the primary cause of her destructive drinking and failure at life. And it's the failure at life. It's, that's the stuff, right? That's in the step four, it talks about we search out the flaws in our makeup that cause our failure. Being convinced that self manifests itself in various ways through these defects of character is what had de defeated us. Self on self. I fuck me. Mm. The world ain't fucking me. I fuck me. Yeah. But if I'm never shown that and I just keep thinking it's about alcohol and I'm, and I'm shielding myself, there's something wrong with my spiritual condition because I should be able to go anywhere on this earth free, other free men may go, provided I keep in this fit spiritual condition. So some of these pockets all over Canada, US, all over the world are diluting themselves with this idea that the drink's actually the problem. But if you're actually in the literature and you're reading the literature over and over and over through sponsorship mainly because that's one of the directives, as part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to others, impressing upon them they must do likewise with still others. 
This is the basis, the foundation of this rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. The foundation of this is working with somebody else going through the material. And if you're actively going through this material with somebody else, you will see the shit that we're talking about. But if you're not actively going through this material, you won't see the literature and you won't see the words and the sentences and the periods in the way that they're designed to fucking hit us. You start developing your recovery based on your environment of other sickness. And everyone is in an opinion or they're in a theory. And the opinions and theories allow you to live in untreated alcoholism and eventually drink again, or if not drink, like you just said, fucking live a subpar recovery, spreading a message to new people that is fucking bullshit. So, you know, I really love that you brought that point up. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, in the step 12 chapter, working with others, it talks about the alcoholic does not understand their true predicament. So that's kind of like a twofold thing as far as I'm concerned. When you first get here, most alcoholics don't understand like the alcoholic cycle, the restless, irritable, discontented, working with those defects of character that actually cause the restless, irritable, discontented. The book says we succumb to the desire again. We don't have a choice. If we live in that discontented, living with our defects and the manifestations of self that cause our failure, we will succumb to the desire. We will pick up because we need relief. And it's not a conscious fucking thought. It just happens. And then we go on the spree. We emerge remorseful. We swear off. And this is repeated over and over. But your typical new person does not understand that. And that's kind of the true predicament. Um, but then later, once you get some sobriety in, once you get some time, you get some distance and time between you and the substance, now we really got to get into the true predicament of the alcoholic. That's the real, that's actually the real predicament. That is the real predicament. That's, that's what it, like, if, if we are going to talk about, like, fractions and percentages, you're talking realistically 20, 30 percent the substance, whatever it may be, 70, 80 percent the character. And again, I think I know the answer. Do you believe that people do not understand that true predicament based on opinions and theories and what the fuck are we talking about i believe so not only do i believe what you just said of course i do but i believe like you know when we talk about the alcoholic condition and the alcoholic not knowing his true predicament i it's probably one of my favorite lines the real deal doesn't you know a lot of these men don't understand their true predicament and that's in regards to the alcoholic condition. And I believe in many rooms, the real alcoholic condition as it's lined out in the big book is eluded. So if a fellowship that believes alcohol is the main problem, they don't even understand the alcoholic condition. What do you think they think about the defective character? Like they are so far from that that they can't even fathom that. They have no idea. Not even close. And so, like, one thing that I like that you were talking about, and, and, and I love this, this is why, is because you're talking about buying the black-on-black -black BMW, you know, getting together with uh, some newcomers and blah, 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 and this, this, that, and they're getting upset. And why they're getting upset is because you are attacking the, the very thing that they're doing. Why a lot of people, this eludes a lot of people, the six and the seven, is because they are currently instincts on rampage they are in the fucking throes in this thing and so when you bring it up instincts balk at investigation and this is why they this is why it's a blazing revulsion because they're in the fucking throes in it dude the engine is moving hardcore right so to answer your question I don't even believe they understand the alcoholic condition let alone something that is in many respects outside the realm of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of this information is presented in the 12 and 12. And from there comes a deeper learning and a deeper understanding about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so we had done this years and years ago when we were right in the throes ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And then from there, we were able to really understand many of its manifestations. 
Okay, I want to switch gears for a second. You had mentioned earlier in the original manuscript, Step 12, Bill W. wrote that himself, and then it was adjusted by the first 100, and it, what it is in the big book today is a little different than what it was in the original manuscript. You and I both refer to the, menu, the original manuscript a lot yeah. through our sponsorship because it doesn't give you the wiggle room and it actually really guides you and directs you and it's firm in what it's saying and it directs you to the process. So in that step 12 in the original manuscript, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of this course of action, we tried to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics. So now I'm six and a bit years in. Um, I've been actually, I don't know if sponsorship's the right word, but I've been mentoring people that are non-alcoholic through the material. And I've been able to take the aspects of step one. It's primarily focused for your general fellowship person. It's, it's focused only on the substance. But I see it so much deeper and different. And I'm able to pull all of step one into a design for living aspect where it's very little about the substance. But I still think it's important to talk about the substance if I'm working with an alcoholic. But I work with alcoholics primarily on the design for living. I focus very little on the substance. But as I'm working with these people that are non-alcoholic, the substance is relationships. Mm. It's porn. It's the gambling. It's the anger. It's anything that's built in a false sense of power. And I love in the alcoholic cycle, restless, irritable discontent, which any normal person can get into. The alcoholic just is the most dream example of that shit. And we make more of a mess of it. Yeah. Right. Because we have that ego. Well, it's all three full blown. Like your average person deals with each one. Yeah. Generally, individually and generally in spurt. 10-4. But they're not going to burn their life down over it. Whereas we could die from it. That's correct. So then the normal person, restless, irritable, discontent, unless they can again experience a sense of ease and comfort that comes at once through anger. And think about anger as, as any person, alcoholic or not, you get into the throes of anger, there's a sense of power there. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of control. There's a sense of self-righteousness. And it feels fucking good in that moment. Same with porn. You watch porn, there's a sense of power and control. Um, gambling, there's a sense of power and control. Um, shopping, fucking relationships, the pursuit of the relationship, the back and forth on the texting or on the messaging or in the conversation. It's like a game. It's a little power game. But there's something in that that's fucking control and power. But when we talk about this part, it's built in a power that's false. It's built in pride. It's built in the world of the material. It's built in force. It's built in the delusion that this shit is going to make me happy. The only thing that makes me happy is at the time I get the feeling of power. That's why I think creator and God is so important to put in replace of that. Because creator and God is built in real power, which is love and kindness. Not me trying to use false power, trying to draw something out of you and get something for free for nothing, basically. Mm. So as, we, as I work with some of these normal people and pull the material out of step one into, let's say, not drinking, but thinking and watching how these manifestations actually start driving us powerfully and blindly, and then we react in these defects that cause our failure, um, I see that it's really helping these people. But I also had somebody, a female, try to help my a friend of mine and this female didn't really understand how to pull the material out of step one for the design for living and i find your average alcoholic does not really understand the design for living part of step one and they have a hard time delivering this to a non-alcoholic person so i guess my question to you or what i'd like on your take is uh what's your opinion with taking this design for living outside of the rooms and outside of alcoholics and addicts and uh, trying to help other people with what's in that book. And I know Bill writes, we know our program has its benefits for all. 
And he kind of alludes to that in different areas of the book. And it is about maximum service to God and the fellows about us. It doesn't say just alcoholics. What's your take on taking this outside of working with alcoholics and addicts only? So I think my take with Bill Wilson and, and why he originally wrote that in is that per how many alcoholics there are, per how, how much general population there is, you know, there's really no comparison. Like you work, you try and work with a man 1939, but he has, that man falls through, he has a wife, he has, you know, maybe parents and maybe kids, right? So you have the ability to practice this for, for the next alcoholic per four people as opposed to losing that one. So I think just to get this thing started, that was his original thought. Now, as we had chatted about, it's riddled that essentially the man works with, the alcoholic man works with the alcoholic man and the wife of that alcoholic would be maybe like an Al-Anon, just in, speaking in general terms, would be maybe an Al-Anon the wife would work with the wife. And that's what I've done for many years. I have worked with the man. Kelly, being alcoholic as well, has worked with the woman. Um, when it comes from design, design for living, like as you know, I am more. I work more with the low bottom. You know, guys on meth, absolutely hopeless. So I have spent a lot of time in the first number of chapters and getting that right, and getting that to where the, my. My objective is to make this man cry for him to understand his true predicament, right? And so that's where a lot of my experience and education has gone to. As you know, I've sponsored enough people that were an alcoholic uh, through a Design for Living format. Um, and, I, and, and I agree with your approach. The step one is, is a, yeah, anger and sex and yada, yada. It's all self, really. What you, that's what you're doing, Right. The substance, you get through the substance with the real deal alcoholic to get to self. For a design for living, you just start at self. Mm -hmm. And then from there, all the, all the parameters fit. Because it's already built around self, right? You got three chapters of the substance. You could substitute self for that. And from the branch, like the olive branches of self, you, that's where you get into your anger and your porn and all this other. That's all manifestations of one thing, mm -hmm. right? And then once you get to three, it's all self anyways. So design for living format is a little bit more deeper understanding of like, if you were to take a guy through the book, through uh, substance, more substance, then some of these parameters would fit that. But then when you take them through design for living, those same parameters can have a, a way different meaning. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit more your design for living. Like I take, I, I have the ability to take a man through the big book twice one of which would be uh, through the substance as a sponsee. The other one would be for, from a sponsor's point of view. And a sponsor's point of view is a little bit more, um, you know, why did I say that? Why would I do that? So generally how I take a guy through the big book is that you bracket. Bracket means it's important enough for a conversation, but if you don't, if you're low on time, you could skip it. Underline, important. Double underline, pretty fucking important. That means that it's practical application. When I take a guy through the sponsor's point of view, I have them do a double bracket, which is for their knowledge only, right? Maybe it's to reaffirm what they're going to talk about, or maybe, you know, they keep that in there, that premise in the back of their mind to, you know, help, uh, to help ha uh, hammer home one of the points, something like that. What, what the, the fuck, fuck are, are we talking, talking about? about? Thank you for tuning in to the UDR cast. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. The viewpoints and the opinions expressed today were solely of the individual sharing them. If you resonated with this episode, please follow us and share this link with anyone that may benefit from it. Please visit us at billward.life to see everything that we have going on. We can recover one person, one family, one community at a time.